1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse number 9, you will find these words. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Lighting the way, part four. You may be seated. There's no doubt about it. We live in a world that is full of people who are lost. We live in a world where many believe that they just don't fit in. We live in a world where many people are searching for a sense of belonging to someone or something. We live in a time where many are simply experiencing what I would like to call this morning an identity crisis. We live in a time where many people both in and out of the body of Christ are experiencing an identity crisis. In other words, for many of us, we don't know who we are. We've lost our identity and we don't know who or what we are. And consequently, we struggle every day with that concept of being a carnal chameleon, one who one day is a super saint, the next day saved, saved today. But tomorrow, I'm feeling like I'm slipping and sliding away. We've lost our identity, and as a result, we are walking around as spiritual zombies trying to find life and its purpose in any and everything around us. I've also discovered that many churches today are losing their identity. Because of the church's identity crisis, we are faced with the very unfortunate dilemma that we must deal with. We must remember how and why Jesus is building his church. A recent survey showed that there are 195 million unchurched people right here in the USA. Each year, 3,500 churches closes their doors forever, while only 1,000 to 1,500 new ones are started up in that same time frame. With over uh, 320,000 churches in America, we may find it hard to believe that there's still a need for more churches to be built. We, the people, are the body of Christ, not a pile of bricks and mortar. I know for some churches that are thriving, and I know many churches that are thriving without having what we would describe as a nice facility. There are congregations meeting in movie theaters, warehouses and strip malls and old barns and they're doing a great work for the Lord. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, there are countless brick buildings with large white steeples, padded pews and stained glass windows that are plateauing, dying, and some of them are just dead. Yeah. Many of them have lost their identity as a Christian church. We have a tendency to measure the success by how many cars are in the parking lot, how many people are in the pews, how much money is taken up on Sunday morning. A church can have thousands of members who give faithfully with the state-of-the-art facilities and, amen, and be successful in our eyes and be a failure according to God's standard for a Christian church. 
On the other hand, a church may meet in someone's basement with a handful of members who are obedient and faithful, and God sees them as a stirring success. Every single week I get emails and I get flyers in the mail and amen, promotion, promoting the latest and the greatest church growth methods. There's always a new program that will help build or grow the church. Don't get me wrong, I would love to see this church feel to the point where we're going to tear out the walls and make it build or, I mean, bigger and bigger to the point that we've got to go build the sanctuary on the corner of Chestnut and Need. But large crowds and big buildings are not the goal of the church. With that being said, I, I, I have good news that God wants this church to grow. God wants the church down the streets to grow. And God wants new churches to be built. And God wants old churches to be revitalized. We, we, we have the privilege to be a part of the process. But if any church is going to grow, if a true church is going to be built, it will be built by God and not by man. I personally believe that the Bible teaches that the building philosophy of the church should include these five elements. I believe that the building philosophy of the church should include these five elements. Acts of mercy, Bible study and teaching, fellowship, outreach, which also includes evangelism, obviously, but then there's worship as well. That's baptism, communion, reading the scriptures, preaching and prayer and singing praises and testimonies and the giving of tithes and offering, just to name a few. All of those are performed by people and not by a building. In our text, we get a glimpse of God's building program. We are able to see how God is lighting the way to build and to grow his church, or in other words, how God is establishing his church's identity. And the first thing I've discovered is this, is that the identity of God's church is established by its vision. The identity of God's church is established by its vision. Coming, in verse 4 it says, coming to him as to living stones, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Since the beginning, God had a plan for his church. God chose his own son to be the cornerstone of the church. Peter reveals in 1 Peter 1 and 20 the fact that God had this plan before the world began. Amen. In the words of God, we have several images of the church. In Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, the church is viewed as a body. In Revelation 21 and 9, the church is viewed as the bride of Christ. In first, or amen, in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16, the church is a building. The image of the church as a building is also seen in our text this morning. Over 20 years ago, a group of believers had a vision for a church in this community. This assembly would, amen, not be here today had not someone had a vision. Ultimately, the reason this church has endured strife from without and unfortunately from within over the past 20 years is because it had a vision. And that a vision was inspired and established by God. Amen. Listen, there's no way to measure the impact the Family Community Church has had through that 20-year history. We will never know how many people are in heaven today, amen, because of the ministry of this church. Or how many people will go to heaven because of the ministry of this local church. Amen. We will never know how many people have benefited spiritually because of the ministry of this church. Those charter members were used of God to build this church. And we are privileged to continue in that work that started some 20 years ago. It all started with the vision that God had established for this community. Let us never forget that faithful people do not build the church of Jesus Christ. Now, Pastor made a mistake. Faithful people do not build the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ builds his church through faithful people. Amen. Not only 
did God have a vision for his church. He prepared the proper foundation for his church. Yeah. And according to 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, his only son laid that foundation. Which brings me to my second discovery, and that is the identity of God's church is established by its foundation. Verse 6 in our text this morning, therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Peter here speaks of the chief cornerstone, of a cornerstone divide by, defined by Webster literally is a stone that forms the base of a corner of a building where two walls join together. Yeah. But metaphorically, it is important quality or feature on which, amen, particular things depend or are based. Jesus is both literally and metaphorically the cornerstone of the church. The chief cornerstone is the basic, essential, and most important part of a building. It is its foundation on which everything else is built. In these verses, Peter is referenced the religious leaders in Israel. They examined Jesus' credentials as the Messiah, and they rejected him. They despised and abused him. And eventually they scourged and they crucified him. But even after all this that they did to him, on that first resurrection moment, he came up out of the grave to live forevermore. God's plan for the foundation of his church would now be accomplished because the foundation had been laid. Even though the Jews and others throughout history have rejected Jesus, we who trust in him recognize and honor, listen, the amen that God has given him, that God has given him something that he's given nobody else. Amen. One writer said that God has given him a name that's above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. <laughs> Every tongue shall confess right. that Jesus Christ is Lord yeah. to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. We know that salvation through Christ is the greatest thing we could have ever received. Yeah. Verse 7 in our text says, Therefore you have who have believed, he is precious. The fact that Christ is the foundation of the church brings us great assurance. <laughs> As the foundation of the church, Christ will endure forever. Amen. Therefore, death, Amen. decay, or depression cannot destroy the church. Amen. Not even death of faithful workers. Not even decay of faithful workers. Yeah. Not even the way man unforeseen depression of faithful workers can destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. The reason that the church has survived and will continue to do so is because the chief cornerstone on which the whole building rests is Jesus Christ. Amen. Any church that is going to be listen, successful for God must be built on Jesus Christ and him alone. Not people, not traditions, not man-made measures of success, nothing other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Matthew 6 and 18 says, and amen, Matthew 16, 18 says, and also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are Peter, you're a little rock, but on my rock, the rock of the revealed word of who I am, the foundation, the cornerstone of the church, I will build not your church, uh, not Pastor McKenzie's church, but my church. And when I build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He did not declare that the gates of hell would not come. No, there's all kind of spirits of darkness coming around the church all the time. And that's not right where the church needs to be, where the darkness is, so he can shine the way of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought not to run from the darkness that comes into the church. We ought to run right to it with the glorious light, the marvelous light Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor, why do you let all them folks that raise all that hell in church just hang around? You ought to just give it a no, 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 no. I could build a church like that, but that would be my church. 
The Bible said, let, amen, let all the dark demons of damnation come as close as they can. And then shine the light of the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've discovered over 20 years of pastoring, over 25 years of ministry, that the word of God will either draw you or drive you away. Amen. You will remain neutral for long. Either it draw you closer to God, or it will drive you right away from Him. <laughs> On this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell, the strongholds of hell, the enemy, the devil, and all his dark demons of damnation shall not, not may not, shall not. We got a couple lawyers in the house. House has a difference between shall not and may not. The third thing I've discovered is the identity of God's church is established by its motivation. Verse 5 declares, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house of holy priests to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, once again, the chief cornerstone was the foundation stone from which all measurements are taken. Every other stone was laid in relationship to the cornerstone. Peter says that we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house. This means that Jesus is the cornerstone and we are, listen, the building blocks of the spiritual house that he's building that the gates of hell should not prevail against. God is building a spiritual house. He is putting all his children in the place where they belong. He is joining us with one another. Yeah. Simply stated, we are, listen, the church that God is building. Peter also states that we are a holy priesthood. This is a great privilege because priests were the ones that had access to God. Do you not know that you have access to God? You don't have to go find another priest or a preacher or anybody else to be able to pray to our Father which art in heaven. Did not Hebrews 4 and 16 declare, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I'm so glad I don't have to run to somebody else in order to get to God. Amen. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, but by him, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Yes, sir. Peter tells us that spiritual sacrifices are acceptable unto God. Spiritual sacrifices are acceptable unto God. This is only possible through Christ. We are priests in the sense of being servants. But Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Yes, this verse indicates the spiritual sacrifices are the motivation for God's church. Spiritual sacrifices. Christians are not stingy with God. Amen. The house that he's building, the people that he's building up and lifting up are not stingy with God. When it comes to our time, our talent, our treasures, we freely sacrifice to our holy and righteous God. We realize that all the time that we have, all the gifts and the talents that he's given us, all the finances and resources that he, hey man, we have, God, they all were given freely to us by God himself. So we freely sacrifice whatever he wants back from us, back to him. Christian people are not stingy people. This may come as a surprise to many in the church today because somewhere along the way, people came to the conclusion that the church should be all about them. They leave church on Sunday morning complaining, someone didn't shake my hand, the sermon was too dry, too long. Some would say it was just too shallow, while others would say it was just over their head. Some didn't like the music because it was too old-fashioned. Others didn't like it because it was too modern and contemporary. 
You can tell that a church has lost its focus and its identity when you hear comments like that. I can't believe that she didn't speak to me today. No one ever notices what I do. Why isn't why wasn't my picture up on the big screen today? Don't folk know what I do, amen. I amen. somebody ought to give me a title around here somewhere. Things just aren't exciting like they used to be. I just wish things would be like they were back at the school. Why can't we do what people's church and other churches are doing around the city today? Amen. Now, just for a moment, pause for a second and just consider the altar of this text this morning. The Apostle Peter, a man who went hungry and thirsty following Jesus Christ. A man who left everything. He knew behind to be a disciple, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. My Bible tells me he was cursed, he was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was persecuted, and eventually crucified for the cause of Christ. Right. Can you imagine what response he would have if he heard some of the self-centered and just some, excuse me, the garbage and the darkness coming out of the mouth of modern-day Christians today and modern-day Christian churches today? Regardless of our motivation, God's motivation for his church is that his people would be as living stones offering him spiritual sacrifices. God has a vision for his church. He's laid the foundation for his church. And there was a specific motivation for his church. And there are countless people who now reject Christ. But they are opposed, and they are opposed to God's church. Even though there is much opposition to God's church, I've discovered that there is a mission for those who belong to him. Finally, notice with me, the identity of God's church is established by its mission. The identity of God's church is established by its mission. Along with God's vision for his church comes the mission for his people. It is a great privilege to be part of God's mission. How is it possible? Verse 9 starts out by saying we are chosen. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. God chose us. What a blessing to think that the God of the universe has chosen us not only to be his people, but to accomplish a special task. Yes, God is the one who builds the church. He has chosen us to use us as his laborers. And several Sundays ago, we discovered that laborers are unskilled workers. Not only has God chosen us, but he's called us. He's called us in verse 9, he says, who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are called, wasn't we were in darkness, and the Lord called us out of the darkness. I like what David says in Psalms 40 and 2. He kind of paraphrases. He says, he brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet up on a rock and established my steps. And when you begin to drill down in that, what David is saying is David said, I was in a pit. I was in depression. I was low as low can get. Have you ever been there in the miry clay? Not just clay, but the miry clay. It's the kind of clay that we may call quicksand today. The more you struggle to get out of it, the deeper you get. In other words, you can't get out of the miry clay by yourself. Somebody has to come and deliver you up out of the miry clay. He says, I found myself in depression, sinking so low that I couldn't get my way out of it. But the Lord, amen, brought me up out of that horrible pit. He threw me a lifeline. He threw me a stick. He threw me a rope and pulled me out and established my steps. Sin is a miry clay for so many of us. We were once dead in our trespasses and sin. Jesus calls us out of darkness. And Peter says that he called us into his marvelous light. He saved our souls. He cleansed our cleansed us from our sin, and he changed our lives. Is there any amens in the house today? Is there any testimonies in the house that he called you in his light out of that miry pit? He saved your soul. He cleansed you from your sins. Listen, and he's changed your life. Is there a difference in your life since the time that Jesus Christ came into your life? Where I used to go, I don't go anymore. The way I used to talk, I don't talk anymore. The way I used to act, I don't act anymore. No, I don't act like 
like I used to act when I was in that pit. When you got me up out of that pit, there's been a change. Yeah. A yeah. wonderful change yeah. has come over me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You may say, boy, you changed, boy. You know, I don't know where, I don't know how you were. You must have been bad. That's right. I was pretty bad. But the good news is God uh, is not through with me. Yeah. I'm still a work in progress. I'm not everywhere he wants me to be. I'm not everything he wants me to be just yet. But he's still working on me. Why? Because he has called me. He's chosen me and he's called me. And not only has he called me and he's chosen me, but what? He has commissioned me. That you may proclaim the praises of him. Peter states that as a result of our being called out of darkness into the marvelous light, we should but show others the goodness of God. There ought to be a difference in you when you go back to your high school or college reunions and listen, and you're checking things out and people looking at you. They say, boy, what a change that's come over your life. People ought to be able to see the difference in your life. Would they they see you as the same old person? Or has there been a change? If you've accepted Jesus Christ since those days, is there a change? Just before Jesus ascended and left the apostles, He left them with some final words concerning his church. He didn't say build the biggest church building you can. He didn't say make sure you have the best youth program that the city can provide. He didn't say work hard to entertain the children. He didn't say fill the pews by any means necessary. Amen. Hand out t-shirts, hand out cookies, hand out punch. Amen. No, no, no. He didn't say have the most vibrant music program that you could ever have. He didn't say make sure to preach eloquent sermons. Jesus' final words before he sent it back to heaven. Listen, Jesus' final words were about the church's mission. Jesus' final words were about the church's mission. In Acts 1.8, he says, but you shall receive power. Just before he got on that cloud, he says, you shall receive power. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, until the end of the earth. What is the mission of the church? You shall receive power, and you shall be a witness for Jesus Christ. What is the mission of God's church? It is for the living stones would make more living stones. The people of God, listen, are to go out and make other disciples. Since you've been saved, how many of the disciples have you poured into? How many other people are going to heaven because of what God has poured into you? How many other people are part of the kingdom of God because you are part of the living stone that God is building up? So are you building up God's house or are you trying to tear it down? Are you part of the light or are you part of the darkness? person said the last thing they remember you talking about the church was it building it up or was it tearing it down we are to live in a way that shows what happens when God brings someone out of darkness out of the miry clay into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ when people see us they should see a difference that we're special. In fact, amen, the text says, listen, here is our true identity. We're living stones, not dead heart stones, living stones, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We ought to just shine, shine, shine. How many times have I heard of my own ears from other pastors say just something about your congregation? They just look like they're light. They just look good. They, oh, where, where do they get their makeup and where do they buy their clothes? No, 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 no. It's not clothes and makeup. No, no, no. It's the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the inside, y'all look young and y'all look good. It's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the oh, amen. Tell them to name them. You so look good. I know that makes you feel better. Amen. It's not because of your makeup or your hair or your clothes. It's because of the God that's on the inside of you. We are the church. We are living stones. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. And we carry ourselves just like that. Some people call it arrogance. Some people call it prideful. I call my true identity in Jesus Christ. I know who I am. I know whose I am. We are the church of God. The church that he's built. As we said earlier, there are countless programs designed to grow the church. There are many strategies intended to build the church. But the only way a church will ever be successful is doing things God's way. The late Hudson Taylor said, God's work done God's way when I lack God's support. 
Let me just paraphrase that and add a little bit to it here. God's work through God's way in God's time. Mm -hmm. When I lack God's support. Everything this church needs to build up what God wants is already here. It's your brother and sister sitting next to you. Everything God needs to build this church up, according to the principles already laid out, is right here. It's right here. So either we're going to build together or we're going to tear down together. Amen. The choice is ours. But the only way a church will ever be successful is doing things God's way. Before the world began, God had a vision for his church. He gave us the foundation of the church in his son, Jesus Christ. The motivation of his church is that his people would offer spiritual sacrifices unto him. And we must do our part to be about the mission of God's church. In closing, why have we been built? 20 years of laboring and building, this is where we are today. Why have we been built? Why is God literally building up this church? It's important that we don't forget the purpose for which we were built Amen. and have been sustained and have prospered over 20 years. If we do forget, we will lose our identity. The Taj Mahal in India is regarded as one of the most beautiful buildings in all the world. Its white marble construction sits on 42 manicured acres. What you may not know is how the building and that structure came about. It began in the year 1632 after the death of the emperor's wife. He was devastated at her death and resolved to honor her by constructing a temple that would serve as her tomb. Her coffin was placed in the center of this large parcel of land. And construction began of the temple around it. No expense was to be spared to make her final resting place magnificent, which ended up costing over $827 million in that day's money. But as weeks turned into months, the emperor's grief over his wife's death turned into a 20-year passion for the building project. He no longer mourned her absence. The construction consumed him on one day, while walking from one side of the construction site to the other, his leg bumped into this hardened wooden box. The prince, if you will, the emperor brushed off his leg, and he ordered that the box be thrown out. What the emperor didn't realize at that time that he gave those orders, he gave the order to the disposal of the coffin of his little wife, which later was retrieved. And so, the one that the temple was intended to honor was now forgotten. But the temple was erected anyway. Listen, church, we face the same danger with church building programs and with many churches today. If we're not careful, we can forget the purpose for which we were constructed by God. We can become so consumed with building process that we forget the one in whom's honor yeah. the spiritual building is intended. Yeah. Peter, if you will, calls us back to our purpose, our focus, to reclaim our rightful identity, to proclaim the praises of him who calls us. The verb translated proclaim means to tell, to show forth, to advertise. We live in this darkened world, a world that really doesn't even know God. It is our responsibility to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. We don't exist so that people can say, what a great building we've constructed over 20 years. We don't even listen, exist so that people can say, what a great bunch of people they are. They're so loving and they're so caring and they're so generous and they just do all these great things. No, 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 no. But we do exist so that when people look at us, when people get around us, they can say, what a great God they serve. How can I be a part of that family? Amen. Amen. That's what the focus is supposed to be. That's our identity in Christ. People often base their self-image and their identity on accomplishments. 
People are quick to tell you what they've accomplished in life. The schooling they achieved, the level of schooling they've achieved, and amen, the job and the employment that they had. They're quick to tell you all those things. Mm -hmm. The last thing they'll tell you, and maybe you have to ask, are you a child of God? Amen. They don't see the value in that. Amen. You ought to talk to me different. Don't you know what I've been through? Don't you know what I've accomplished in life? You ought to treat me different. <laughs> it's not about you. Thank you. People are looking at me, no, God. But our relationship with Christ is far more important than our job, our success, our wealth, and our knowledge. We have been chosen by God as his very own. And we have been called to represent him to others. Our lives are to be a living billboard before a holy and righteous God. I remember reading about that Alexander the Great when he would encamp outside of a city before he would conquer that city. He would set up a light at night and he would give word to all those in the city that tomorrow I'm coming into the city. And if you come out and surrender, when well, you see the light burn, mercy will be granted to you. But you must come out while you can see the light. However, if the light goes out, or the sun comes up. When I come into the city, don't expect any mercy. Do we realize that God is setting up life after life, and city after city, in barangay and barangay, village and village all around the world, calling men to repent, offering them mercy to come out of the miry clay and to give them eternal life. But it's amazing how few will come. They hear the cry, they see the light, but just as Alexander the Great would go in and take that city, one day God is coming back. Amen. Amen. And when the door of mercy is shut, Amen. it will be shut forever. It will be shut. And while there's blood running warm in your veins today, you need to open up your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ.